Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker. Greta Christina was born in Chicago on December 31st, not so very long ago. She is a graduate of Reed College. Greta is a regular atheist correspondent for Alternet, Free Inquiry, and The Humanist, and has been writing about atheism in her own Greta Christina's blog since 2005. Her blog is now part of The Orbit. Hemet Mehta, at The Friendly Atheist, ranked her blog in the top 10 most popular atheist blogs. Greta has been writing professionally since 1989 and has been a full-time freelance writer and speaker since 2012. Her writing about atheism has appeared in print, in Skeptical Inquirer, and the anthology Everything You Know About God is Wrong, as well as in her own books, Coming Out Atheist, How to Do It and How to Help Each Other, and Why, and Why Are You Atheists So Angry? 99 things that piss off the godless. And her books are up here for sale, so please get one today and have her sign it while she's here. Speaking to Chris Mooney for the Point of Inquiry podcast, she stated that there isn't one emotion affecting atheists, but anger is one of the emotions that many of us have. It drives others to participate in the movement. She feels that there are many goals for the atheist movement, more separation of church and state, ending bigotry against atheism, and for some, persuading people out of religion. She thinks it is a valid goal to work towards a world without religion. As a speaker, she is a movement favorite and has appeared at many regional and national conferences, including the Reason Rally in 2012. In 2013, she was named the International Team Honored Hero of the Foundation Beyond Belief. The Foundation teams raise money for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. She has served on the Foundation Beyond Belief's Board of Directors. In 2013, she received the LGBT Humanist Pride Award from the American Humanist Association. In 2015, she received the first Secular Student Alliance Ambassador Award, which was the first time they ever gave the award. Christina is an advisory board member of Secular Student Alliance and a donor at the lifetime membership level. Outside of her atheist work, she is the editor of Paying For It, a guide by sex workers for their clients, and of the best erotic comic anthology series, and has written the erotic novella Bending and the erotic fiction collection Bending, Dirty Kinky Stories About Pain, Power, Religion, Unicorns, and More. Her writing has also appeared in three volumes of Best American Erotica. She has also written about cats, <laughs> for Catster, and has written for the magazine Femme Feminism. Greta Christina has lived in San Francisco Bay Area since 1984 and is happily married to her wife, Ingrid Nelson, whom she has been in love with since 1998. And Ingrid's here today, too, so please make sure we give Ingrid a special welcome today. So, everybody, please help me welcome Greta Christina. Thank you so much for that very warm welcome. I appreciate it. And thank you all so much for coming out here today. I'm, I'm really grateful. There are, you have many choices of, of things to do on a Sunday morning, including sleeping in. So uh, thank you. Thank you for coming out here today. Um, quick note about my books. They are here for sale, and I do uh, take credit cards. Uh, they're also, all of my books are available in ebook or audiobook if you prefer those formats. Um, uh, so today I am talking about practicing atheism in everyday life. So, you're an atheist, now what? What does it mean to live as an atheist? Living without religion is not always so different from living with it. Atheists and believers are all human. You know, we all laugh at jokes, listen to music, care about our loved ones, uh, try to be good. But there are real differences. When you think the meaning of your life is handed to you by God, you're going to live differently than if you think we create our own meaning. When you think God is your co-pilot and your life is planned by this all-perfect, all-knowing creator who still gave you sinuses for no apparent reason, um, you're going to live differently than if you think nobody's driving the bus and you'd better grab the wheel. 
When you think you and your loved ones are going to live forever in a blissful afterlife where everyone somehow magically gets along, uh, you're going to live differently than if you think this short life is the only one we have. There are differences between a religious life and a godless one, and they're not trivial. Now, the narrowest definition of atheism is that it's simply the conclusion that there are no gods. And if you want to define atheism that way, that's fine. But conclusions don't exist in a vacuum. Conclusions have implications sometimes profound ones, and that includes the conclusion that gods don't exist. So for me, and for many people, atheist doesn't just mean I don't believe in God, it also means the values and the ways of life that are implied by that conclusion or inspired by it. Uh, it means the skeptical, evidence-based ways of thinking that made us non-believers in the first place, and it means the communities, organizations, and movements that are springing up among people who don't believe in any gods. Now, if you want to use the words humanism, skepticism, free thinking, organized atheism, or, or any other word to mean these things instead, that's fine with me. Uh, whatever we call it, this is what I'm talking about today. Once we accept that there are no gods, how can that shape our lives? You know, how do we decide what it means to be good with no gods writing the rule book and, and handing out justice? How do we create meaning for our lives when we accept that there are no gods creating that meaning for us? How do we deal with illness, suffering, injustice, and death without belief in an afterlife or a supernatural being who's going to make everything okay? How do we deal with the rise of fascism? with the empowerment and emboldenment of white supremacy, with tampered elections, with the frightening and dangerous world we're living in right now, without, again, belief in a supernatural being who's going to fix everything. How do we create communities for ourselves and support each other in our individuality while still coming together as a vaguely coherent whole? And how do we experience pleasure and joy and wonder in a brief, fragile, finite life. Uh, so I have written a book about this topic. It's called The Way of the Heathen, Practicing Atheism in Everyday Life. Uh, much of this talk is taken from ideas from that book. And when you look at the book, hang on, I'll grab a copy to show you the cover. Um, um, so when you look at the book, um, one of the first things you see is a visual joke. Uh, the book is titled The Way of the Heathen, and the cover art shows a person walking down a road which branches into lots of different roads and lots of different directions. There's no one right way to be a non-believer, um, and I'm not telling you the one right way to do it. Um, I'm offering questions to think about, ideas that may be useful, uh, and encouragement to choose your own way. So let's start with some big picture stuff. What does it all mean? I love that question, what does it all mean? It's so big and yet it's so vague. Um, so, but what does it all mean? When we don't believe in gods or the supernatural, how does that affect our fundamental relationship with reality? How does what we don't believe change how we see the meaning of our lives? So when I talk about religion and why I think it's mistaken, um, I sometimes get exhorted by religious believers to be more open to the universe. You know, I've been told that a belief system based on what isn't seems reductive, and when I turn my mind towards the things I don't believe in, my world gets smaller. So I do have a belief system. Every atheist, humanist, non-believer I know has a belief system, or almost all of them. Um, we have values and priorities that shape how we live. So, why is not believing in things? Why is not believing in gods, souls, the afterlife, the supernatural, so crucial to that worldview? Because I believe in reality. <laughs> I, I believe that reality is far more important and far more interesting than anything we could make up about it. And trying to understand reality is one of the most valuable things we can do with our lives. The real 
universe is magnificent. It is fascinating, and it's way weirder than anything we could have made up about it. Space that bends, continents that drift, brain goop that creates consciousness, solid matter that is actually mostly empty space, that rocks my world. All of that does. And we found all this out by letting go of preconceptions and rejecting ideas that aren't supported by evidence. But that's the thing. The negative part of this process is crucial. We can't say, yes, the Earth orbits the Sun. Who would have thought that? Without also saying, no, the Sun does not orbit the Earth. We can't say, yes, the continents are moving, isn't that wild? Without also saying, no, the continents are not fixed in place. We can't say this stuff is almost certainly true without also saying all that other stuff is almost certainly not true. There is an impossibly huge infinitude of things we could imagine about the universe, and only the tiniest fraction are actually true. And if we're going to be open to the mind-altering magnificence and freakiness of reality, we have to be willing to say no to the overwhelming majority of things that we could imagine about it. We have to be rigorous in sorting reality from unreality and relentless in rejecting unreality. And I have no problem with stories about imaginary realities. Stories and imagination, they're essential parts of our human lives, and they're also just fun. Uh, but if we care about reality, we need to not fool ourselves into thinking that our stories are true. Our world does not get bigger when we value our experience of reality more than reality itself. It doesn't get bigger when we treat every possibility as equally likely and choose between them based on which ones we would like to believe. It doesn't get bigger when we ignore or deny evidence. It doesn't get bigger when we armor ourselves against reality. Our world gets bigger when we let reality in. This is true for scientific reality and it's true for human reality, for the reality of other human lives. Our world gets bigger when we let reality in. It gets bigger when we pay careful attention to reality and let it take priority over our opinions about it. Our world gets bigger when we let reality be what it is. And reality is what I believe in. Now, believing in reality might seem like an oxymoron. Doesn't everybody do that? Doesn't everybody think that the things they believe are true? Doesn't, isn't that what it means to believe something? Um, and doesn't everybody think that it's important to believe that things are true? But one of the many hard lessons that we've learned from the political landscape in the last several years, and especially in the last year or two, is that for millions of people, reality is at best a very low priority, and at worst is an open enemy. And this isn't just a right-wing phenomenon. There is fake news and confirmation bias and stubborn clinging to disproven ideas everywhere on the political spectrum. But this isn't just a right-wing phenomenon, but it is especially a right-wing phenomenon. It is amplified by the right-wing's naked hunger for power at any cost, including the cost of blatantly disregarding the truth. And it's amplified by the religious right which proudly embraces faith over facts, not just as acceptable, but as virtuous, as a positively good way to live life. And if there's anything that the atheist, humanist, and secular communities can contribute to the political and moral landscape uh, right now in the world we're living in now and in the coming years and decades, I think it might be this. At least in theory and sometimes in practice, we care about reality, and we prioritize truth over our opinions. We're a community with a very interesting common thread. The thing that we have in common is that we admitted we were wrong about something very important. It's not universally true. There are some non-believers who were raised that way, but for most non-believers, we thought something was true, and we admitted we were wrong. 
And that is a gift. It is a powerful value to hang on to in these difficult times. And I would encourage all of us to adhere to that value and to step up our game on it. So let's talk about that for a little while. Let's talk for a little bit about being better people, about stepping up our game, especially in dangerous or difficult times. Let's talk about ethics. When we don't have a rule book telling us, here's what it means to be a good person. What it means to be a good person is you don't eat shellfish. Uh, uh, when we don't have that rule book, what does it mean to be a good person? And very importantly, how does a commitment to reality affect what we do when we're trying to be good? Now, there's a really obvious way that a commitment to reality shapes what it means to be a good person. A better understanding of reality helps us do better things. You know, for instance, if we want to help somebody who's sick, it's important to know what will help them, that this medicine will help them, that this other medicine will make them worse, that praying to our God isn't going to do a damn thing. If we want to be good and do good things, we need to accept the realities about cause and effect, what actually helps people, what actually hurts people. But there's another way that accepting reality helps make us good people, and it has to do with accepting some difficult realities about ourselves. We all think of ourselves as good people. We, there's an important confirmation bias baked into our brains, uh, and that is that we think we're good. Um, we know that we're flawed, uh, but we think of ourselves as basically good people. But what does that mean, to think of ourselves as good? And I think there's two different ways to think of ourselves as good people. The first is by rationalizing. It's a cognitive bias all skeptics should be aware of. Um, our brains are programmed to think that whatever we've done, it is smart, competent, and ethical. Literally, the minute we do anything, our brain rushes in with rationalizations for why it was okay. And we, so we start with the assumption that we're good and we go from there. We interpret reality from starting with, through that lens. We think, and we think of good as something that we are, as an essential part of our nature. So the other way to think of ourselves as good people means understanding that we aren't always good. It means questioning and doubting. It means asking ourselves, am I doing the right thing here? Did I do the right thing back there? Could I have done something different? It means understanding that being good is hard. That it sometimes involves making the least bad choice of a number of bad choices. It means constantly examining what being good even is. We think of being good less as something that we are and more as something that we do, and therefore as something that's more fragile. Very few people think of themselves as evil. You know, there's a reason that our brains start rationalizing what we do as soon as we do it. And there's a reason that paradoxically and very frustratingly, we're more likely to rationalize our bad behavior when we've done something a lot, when we've committed more time and resources to it, or when we've, done, when we've really gone out on a limb for it, for it, especially in public, or when we've done something really bad. We don't enjoy thinking of ourselves as bad people. We can barely stand it. Seeing ourselves as bad is so painful. We will deny reality, we will cut off people we care about, and we will even continue doing the same awful things and digging ourselves deeper into that hole rather than admit that we screwed up. It, it can be comforting to externalize evil. To see evil as something the bad guys do, you know, to, and it can be comforting to think of like the wicked witch of the West, you know, cackling over her beautiful wickedness and think that that's what evil is. Um, but this is a false comfort and it's a dangerous one. If there's anything that we learned from the Milgram experiment or from the Stanford prison experiment, it's that evil is not that thing out there. Evil is a way of being. It is a capacity that we all have. We all have the capacity to be bigoted, to be afraid of the strange, to be corrupted by power, to obey orders or go along with the crowd even when we know it's wrong, to reflexively defend ourselves and people on our side even when we've done something awful. And we all have the capacity to hate and dehumanize people who we see as not like us. 
we need to be willing to see evil not as something people are, but as something people do. And, and therefore, we need to be willing to see evil as something we might do. You know, we need to accept that we absolutely have empathy and moral instincts that evolved in us as a social species. At the same time, we also have self-preservation instincts that evolved in us as, you know, a species that's still alive. Um, we need to understand that these will always be in conflict. Uh, we need to be willing to ask, not are we the good guys, but are we doing the right thing? And when we think we may have done something wrong, or when people tell us that we've hurt them, we need to sit with the discomfort and let ourselves feel uncomfortable for a while instead of immediately arguing or rationalizing. And we need to do this again and again for as long as we live. This is a lifetime project. Now, this self-doubt and this self-questioning does have its downsides. Um, it makes it really easy to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, it, ca it can be immobilizing. We can get so worried about doing the right thing, we don't do anything at all. Um, we sometimes think of rationalization as this weird glitch in our brains that we wish we could get rid of, but it is actually essential. We would be frozen in place without it. Um, so I keep thinking about what Hillel said. Um, this is a translation from the Hebrew, um, and it's, I don't know if it's the best translation, but it's the first one that I heard, and it's the one that resonates with me. If I am not for myself, then who will be for me? But if I am only for myself, who am I? We have to be for ourselves if we're going to survive. We have to be for others if our lives are going to have meaning. We have to constantly tinker with that balance. And the ways we think about being good are part of that balance. You know, if we're going to function, if we're not going to be immobilized, we have to think of ourselves as good people. But if we want that goodness to be meaningful, we have to be willing, at least sometimes, to question it. And this is going to be even more important in the current political situation and in the years to come. In distressing and dangerous times, being ethical, including being more willing to question our own ethical choices, it's more difficult and it's more important. It's more difficult because we're faced with harder ethical conundrums. When there's desperate need all around us, who do we decide to help? And that's always a hard question, but it becomes harder when desperation and need are growing greater and when our own resources are increasingly stretched thin. When we're building alliances, which ethical differences do we accept and which ones are deal breakers? It's always a hard question, but it becomes harder when the stakes are higher. When alliance building is more important than ever, when intersectionality is also more important than ever, and when everybody is stressed out, on edge, and has a hair trigger temper. And when we're fighting evil, and yes, I am going to say it, the hard right, white supremacist, misogynist, hatefully and violently bigoted, self-enriching, foxes guarding every hen house fascism that is on the rise in the United States right now, that is evil. When we're fighting evil, when we're fighting people who have made it clear that they have essentially no limits in how dirty they will fight to gain and retain power, how dirty do we get our own hands? If we always fight squeaky clean, I guarantee you that we will lose. If we let ourselves fight too dirty and put no limits on how dirty we fight, we become the evil we're fighting. Where do we draw that line? In dangerous times, in difficult times, being good is more difficult and it's more important. There's more at stake. And I don't know how to answer those questions. It's very much case-by-case -case basis, and I'm sure we're going to disagree with about them a lot. I'm sure I'm going to get, get the question wrong a lot. But when I'm trying to make these hard choices, one of the foundations that I will be hanging on to is, does this choice reflect reality? So, accepting reality can make us better people. Uh, what are some other ways that it can help us in our everyday lives? How does accepting reality help us through difficult times? How do we cope with suffering, injustice, 
and death without belief in a God who has a plan, without belief in an afterlife where all the wrongs will be righted and everything will be magically okay. Uh, there's a lot of directions we could take this conversation. Uh, we could talk about coping with illness, uh, with bad luck, with depression, with grief, with our own mortality. Um, and I do talk about all of that in the book. But because of the disaster of November 8th, 2016, um, I want to take this in a different direction. Um, I want to talk about some hard realities about injustice. I want to talk about resistance. And I want to talk about injustice and resistance, not as a crisis, but as a permanent condition of our lives. I want to talk about permanent struggle. And I didn't write this section of the book in response to the election. I, I wrote it a while ago. It's something I've been thinking about for a long time. But this idea of permanent struggle became much more relevant uh, after the election. And I'm trying very hard to make peace with it. Um, I'm trying to make peace with the idea that in almost every struggle I care about passionately, I am going to live the rest of my life without winning. The day that I die, there will still be hatred of women, disgust for queers, contempt for black people, revulsion for trans people, pointless poverty, grotesque inequality, and stinking rich people who don't give a damn about any of it as long as they've got theirs. That was true before the election, and it's true now. And I'm trying to make peace with the idea of survival as victory. The idea of harm reduction. The idea that shoving the world into a slightly better place, or even into a slightly less crappy and unlivable place, even just holding the line against people who are trying to make things worse, trying to make peace with the idea that this is a form of winning. And trying to let go of the entire idea of winning. And I am obviously doing a lousy job. This is very hard for me. I'm trying to make peace with how much of our progress isn't really progress so much as it is digging ourselves out of a hole. So much of progress means alleviating suffering and righting inequalities, pushing back against bigotry and hatred and brutality that should never have been there in the first place. So much of progress isn't building something new, it's building a level foundation. It isn't adding positive numbers, it's struggling just to get to zero. And I'm okay with the idea of permanent struggle. Well, uh, no, obviously, I'm not okay with that. I am beginning to see okay on the horizon. I am profoundly not okay with how much of the struggle is a waste of time. And I don't mean that it's a waste of time in the sense that the work isn't worth doing. Of course the work is worth doing. The foundation is wildly uneven. There are a ton of holes to dig out of. But we shouldn't have to do it. We wouldn't have to do it if we didn't have such a terrible history and if people weren't so terrible so much of the time. I'm trying to make peace with how much we could all build, how high we could all climb, if so many of us weren't digging out of these pointless, poisonous, unnecessary holes. And if so many others weren't digging more holes, digging deeper holes, so they can live high on the pile of dirt and bodies. I'm trying to make peace with how much time and energy and resources we spend convincing people just to give a damn. The world would be so much better if everyone cared about justice and equality and people just living decent lives. If everybody cared just a little more, just 5% more, we would be so much better off. And I'm trying to make peace with how few people are willing to do even that. I'm trying to make peace with all the ways I'm part of the problem. My comfort is built on other people's suffering. Cheap food, cheap consumer goods, plentiful energy, all come at the cost of other people's grossly exploited labor, and it comes at the cost of pouring garbage into the oceans and the air. And for all the dozens of ways that I'm living in holes and I'm clawing my way out and having dirt poured at me every, at every turn, there are also dozens of ways that I won the lottery the day I was born. And it's a lottery that was funded by beating people into the ground and taking their land and their money and their labor. 
No matter how careful I am, there's no way to completely disengage from systems that benefit me at other people's expense. The only way to never hurt anybody is to be a hermit. And I'm trying to make peace with the fact that I don't want to make peace with this. Causing pain and shrugging it off is exactly the thing that I'm struggling against. If I'm going to be the person I want to be, I am always going to question my compromises, doubt my motives, and wonder if I could do better. I'm trying to make peace with the fact that no matter how far we push things in the right direction, we will still have to struggle because there will always be people pushing things backwards. We have gained ground and lost it so many times. So much of our work is regaining lost ground. And all of our good work could be undone in a generation. As we know from November of 2016, all of our good work could be undone in a day. I'm trying to make peace with the fact that there will always be people who benefit from being selfish, heartless, and willing to ignore suffering. Whatever structures we build for justice, there are always going to be people looking for loopholes and finding ways to game the system to their advantage. And these aren't just cackling villains. These aren't just the 1%. Human nature is selfish as well as selfless. Callous as well as compassionate. We are all scared, self-protective, rationalizing, and far too willing to say, screw you, Jack, I've got mine. This is human nature. So much of our history re records the battles between our better natures and our worse ones. The struggle for justice is a struggle against human nature. So it will always need to be fought, permanently, forever. And I don't know if this is hard for me because I've lived my whole life in the United States and so many of my country's stories are about winning and happy endings. And I don't know if it's just that human minds are wired to see life as a narrative, a story with a beginning and a middle and an end. And it is hard to see the struggle as a never-ending story, as a tale that began centuries before we were born and will continue to be told centuries after we die. I don't know why this is so hard. I'm just trying to make peace with it. At the 2015 American Atheists Convention in Memphis, uh, Anthony Pinn, who's an extraordinary writer and speaker, I strongly recommend that you check out his work. Uh, Anthony Pinn gave a talk on what the atheist movement could learn from hip hop. Um, and as he so often does, he said something that very strongly resonated me. I actually wrote this piece in direct response to what he said. Um, except I didn't remember exactly what he said, so I emailed him, and this is what he, how he phrased it in an email afterwards. We do what we can, where we can, knowing that oppression is web-like in nature. The proper posture is one of perpetual struggle, perpetual rebellion against injustice. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. The price of justice is permanent struggle. And there is this odd way that permanent struggle brings a degree of peace. Trying to win the struggle for justice, trying to navigate by a non-existent light at the end of the tunnel, groping our way towards a non-existent promised land, that brings a terrible sense of frustration and failure. You've been working so hard, why isn't it better? Why isn't it perfect? Letting go of that impossible dream means we can take satisfaction in our small achievements, in the harm that we've reduced. And it means we can be smarter about the struggle. Or we can make better decisions about short-term goals versus a big picture. And when we don't win, when we aren't perfect, when we don't see our way, when we don't see any way, it's not because we aren't good enough. The fact that I'm not winning, that the people I'm fighting alongside aren't winning, doesn't mean there's something wrong with us. The reason we're not winning is that winning is impossible, and winning is not the point. And there is a degree of peace in seeing my work as, as part of something bigger, a link in a chain. There is peace in being one more descendant of Sisyphus, pushing that rock upward, passing wisdom and experience on to the next generation of rock pushers. There is peace in knowing that without our struggle, the rock would always be at the bottom, 
grinding people into the ground. I'm trying to make peace with all of this, and I'm beginning, maybe, to see okay on the horizon. But struggle isn't something we do alone. Resistance isn't something we do alone. And that brings me to my next question about living an atheist life. As atheists, how do we build relationships? How do we build secular communities? So much community building is done around religion. Religion often calls itself faith-based communities. How do we build reality-based communities? And how do we build reality-based relationships and organizations with other atheists? Again, this is a very large topic. A lot of people are talking about it. Um, I believe that Greg Epstein and James Croft are writing an entire book about atheist and humanist community building. Um, I have a ton to say about it. And I'm sure that people here in this community have a lot to say about it that I don't know. Um, I hope we can talk about it afterwards. But there's a particular topic that comes up a lot when we talk about atheist and humanist community building. It's somewhat contentious, but it is hugely important. Um, if we're going to build healthy, thriving, supportive communities, that especially if we're going to build communities that are a relevant part of the resistance that's being built right now, we need to work, really work, on diversity, inclusivity, and social justice. And from a purely ethical position, this is the right thing to do, but it is also the smart thing to do. It is the evidence-based thing to do. The thing that accepts reality and responds to it. And that's the case I'm going to focus on today. Working on diversity and social justice is smart and evidence-based because there are female atheists. There are black atheists. There are Latinx atheists. There are working class and blue collar atheists. There are transgender atheists non-gender binary atheists, there's gay, lesbian, and bisexual, pansexual, asexual atheists, it's atheists of Asian descent, Middle Eastern descent, Native American descent, there are immigrant atheists, there are disabled atheists, there's atheists with mental illness, I'm one of them, uh, there's young atheists, there's old atheists, and all of these folks are atheists and we all need a voice in how this movement is built and how our communities are built. Making organized atheism and organized humanism a welcoming place to all of these people and more, it's not just the right thing to do, it is how we're going to turn ourselves into a powerhouse. And in this difficult world we're living in right now, in the difficult years to come, it's how we're going to make ourselves relevant. And when we fail to do this, we have failed at one of the most central parts of our mission, building supportive communities for non-believers. When women show up to meetups and never come back because creepy men were invasively creeping at them, we have failed at that mission. When black people show up at conferences and don't come back because almost all the speakers were white, or all the speakers were white, we have failed at our mission. When people of Asian descent come to our meetups and don't come back because they got told, you speak the language so well, yeah. <laughs> we have failed at our mission. When people without a college education come to our meetups or our online forums and don't come back because they heard patronizing talk about how college-educated people are more likely to be atheists and this means atheism is smarter and better, we have failed at our mission. When young people come to our events and, and don't come back because every new idea they offered got shot down, we have failed at our mission. When trans people come to our events and don't come back because they were asked invasive questions about the state of their genitals, we have failed at our mission. When poor and working class people don't show up for our events because they're expensive or aren't near public transportation, we have failed at our mission. When people with disabilities don't come to our events because they're not accessible, we have failed at our mission. And when marginalized people of all varieties point out any of this and get gaslighted or dismissed or told to stop talking about it, we have failed at our mission. When marginalized people point out ways that they got excluded and were told, no, you didn't, or you're being divisive, or you're blowing things out of proportion, or we didn't mean to exclude you, therefore you didn't feel excluded. Therefore, <laughs> you should stop asking us to change. <laughs> We have failed at our mission. When marginalized people tell us that we've hurt them and we turn the conversation to our own hurt feelings about how they told us, 
rather than the damage that we've done. We've failed at our mission. When marginalized people ask for more focus on issues that concern them and are told no because that would be mission drift, we've failed at our mission. By the way, a quick note about mission drift. If we can do highway cleanups and blood drives without it being mission drift, we can work with Planned Parenthood and Black Lives Matter. It's a lot closer to our mission. And when people's basic right to be treated with dignity and equality gets called the 5% we disagree on, we get asked to shut up about it, why can't we focus on the 95% we agree on? We have failed at our mission. And all of this is stuff that really happens. I have heard of, seen, or experienced every one of these incidents in organized atheism. In most cases, I've seen them, heard them, or experienced them again and again and again. This is not an exception. There are a hundred thousand ways that we show unintentional bias towards marginalized people. And if we want to get all reality based on it, there is ample research about this. Uh, if you do a Google search on the term microaggressions or the term unconscious bias, uh, you'll see this research. We are wired. We're, I'm not going to say we're wired. We have been trained from birth to have biases against people who are different from us. And that doesn't make us bad people. It means that we've unconsciously picked up on the biases of our culture. That's completely understandable. What it does mean is we have to accept this response of this reality, take responsibility for it, and work to be better. And it means that since we have unintentional bias, we have to make a conscious effort to overcome it. It is not going to happen any other way. And I want to wind up today uh, by moving away from this somewhat content, uh, contentious topic uh, and moving towards a more pleasant topic. I want to talk about the most pleasant topic of all. I want to talk about pleasure. And it can be hard to look for pleasure when there's so much that is terrible in the world. It can feel jarring, cognitively dissonant, even guilty, to turn away from the horrors of the world and seek pleasure for ourselves. But in the difficult world we're in now, and the difficult years ahead, we need pleasure more than ever. Because when we're participating in a resistance movement, pleasure is resistance. Pleasure is self-care. It refuels us. It gives us reasons to stay alive and stay in the fight. It makes us strong and able to fight. Pleasure is a way we take care of each other. And taking care of each other is resistance. It strengthens all of us and it strengthens the bonds between us. Pleasure is a way that we grow our movement. Making resistance fun is a great way to bring people into it. And pleasure itself, for its own sweet sake, is resistance. When we're fighting a fascist groundswell that is driven in large part by the religious right, when we're fighting an ideology that thinks people don't own our own bodies, when we're fighting a regime based on sexist slut-shaming, contempt for queers, hatred of black and brown bodies, and backlash against reproductive rights, pleasure is defiance. When our pleasure and our bodily autonomy are the exact things being oppressed, pleasure is resistance. So, let's talk about pleasure. When atheists consider the question of the meaning of life without God, we often answer with the big things. What does life mean without God? Well, what gives our life meaning is love and work and art, family, friendship, community, the never-ending search for knowledge, and all of these things are awesome. They are central parts of how I build meaning in my own life. But I'd like to add a few items to that list. What brings meaning to my life? Donuts. <laughs> Fashion magazines. Costume jewelry. Cat videos. Playing games. Um, pretentious, overpriced cocktails with a lot of ridiculous crap in them. I live in San Francisco, which is the ground zero for pretentious, overpriced cocktails with a lot of ridiculous crap in them, and I love it. Um, messing around on Facebook. Um, TiVoing the Olympics and watching obscure sports I've never heard of. Cat videos. <laughs> um, coming up with a sexy, gorgeous, wildly inappropriate outfit for the Dyke March. 
Um, padrone peppers, sautéed in hot oil until they blister and then sprinkled with sea salt. Sitting on the sofa watching Steven Universe and letting cats crawl all over us. Cat videos. <laughs> the the never-ending search for a perfect cup of decaf coffee. I want to speak in praise of frivolity. When we don't think there's any God or afterlife, we can certainly create meaning from work and art, charity and activism, children living after us, our ideas surviving us, the ripples of how we affect people continuing to ripple out after we're gone. But if other people are the meaning of our life, what meaning do their lives have? If we exist to make other people happy, and they exist to make still other people happy, at what point does that end? At some point, doesn't experience get to just matter simply because it matters? Consciousness is amazing. All of it. The overflowing love I felt the day Ingrid and I got married was amazing. And the deliciousness I tasted this morning when I ate Concord grapes and drank coffee was amazing. The sense of accomplishment and community I felt the day I published my first book was amazing. And my hysterical, uncontrollable laughter when we were playing zombie flux at the hot chocolate and games party was amazing. The connection I felt with Rebecca and Gerard in our intense conversation about queer history was amazing. And the connection I felt with Ingrid in last night's conversation about our cats was amazing. The frivolous bits of life are the universe knowing itself, experiencing itself, and taking joy in itself. They're the conscious bits of the universe connecting with each other through one person designing a hot pink dress and another person wearing it and smiling at their reflection in a window. Through one person painting a picture of a parrot on the sidewalk and another person snapping a picture of it and putting it on their blog. Through one person taking a video of their cat and putting it on Facebook and another person liking it. Through one person making a donut and another person biting into it and experiencing joy. Carl Sagan famously said that we are the way we are the way that the universe knows itself, and that is true and that is important. We are also the way that the universe experiences pleasure. And when we let go of the idea that life is only meaningful because of God, when we truly accept that meaning is ours to create, we can stop being size queens about meaning. When we let go of the idea that joy only matters when it brings glory to an omnipotent creator, we can let every kind of joy matter. Thank you. Uh, so I think we have time for we have time for some questions, right? Um, I'm going to ask that you uh, try to. Uh, there's a number of people have questions. I'm going to ask that you keep your questions brief, and that you make them questions. And <coughs> make sure you hold the microphone real close to your mouth as well. That was a marvelous talk, oh, inspirational, and uh, one one observation though. I mm -hmm. think that our mission. Uh, will be more incomplete if I, I agree with like 95, 98 percent of what you had to say. Mm -hmm. But what you have to say should be said to a group of uh, Republicans mm -hmm. or to Christians. Mm -hmm. And I've said the same thing to the atheist group that I'm a member mm -hmm. of too. I think that there's speakers that mm -hmm. they could benefit from listening mm -hmm. to because there has, if there's going to be a, an alliance created, mm -hmm. then the ideas have to get out there to be discussed. Yeah. And much of what you said, mm -hmm. um, the, the Republican friends that I have mm -hmm. would agree with a lot of what you had mm -hmm. to say. That would be awesome. They're not inviting me to speak. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I would love it if you know I got a chance to speak to Christians and Republicans. Um, I will say that um, since the election and since there's been so much resistance work, um, I've been doing more 
I hate the word, but for lack of a better one, interfaith work. Um, and I do think that that's something that that we need to at least consider. And I know that there's some people for whom they just can't, and that's fine. Um, but there are a lot of progressive religious believers who are on the front lines um, in the resistance work that's being done right now. And I think that we, we would benefit, and they would benefit, uh, from us working together on issues we have in common. And also, I think that they would learn more about atheists, because there is a lot of anti-atheists misunderstanding so yeah I would love to do that they're not inviting me to speak so uh, hi yes hi there um, I found your comments um, generally about human nature and the condition um, I would not disagree with most of that analysis mm -hmm. okay especially about biases unconscious you know mm -hmm. reflection of culture and environment uh, you said we rationalize as good, mm -hmm. and I'm curious as to what are your reference points? You mentioned ethics. You never talked about what they meant or what they give you, okay? Um, and, and also, like you said, we failed at our mission. Why do you think it's the global, our mission? As opposed to how you rationalized that we failed at our mission, so you must be right. Um, well, the first question is, what is ethics? That is way too big to, a question to answer. Uh, very, the very short answer to that is, biologically, from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, we seem to have evolved with some, some values that make us function as a social species, and they include uh, caring about justice, caring about people being harmed, uh, loyalty, um, and a respect for authority or a respect for order, orderliness. Um, and obviously different people have prioritized these differently. Um, uh, philosophically, I think ethics, the best way it's been ex was explained to me was um, you know, the best soundbite version, is that ethics is understanding that other people's matter, other people's lives matter to them as much as ours do to us, and that from an objective experience, um, uh, you know, you know that, 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 that your experience matters to you as much as my experience matters to mine, and understanding that, essentially understanding that you are human which is sometimes hard to do. Um, as far as, you know, are we failing in our mission, the question of whether we're failing in our mission, I, I'm not making up that mission. Many, many, many atheist, humanist, secularist organizations talk about community building. They, they explicitly state it, that community building is one of, one of their key missions, you know, build, building communities among non-believers. And that's when I say that when we do all these things that keep people out, that keep people from coming back, we've failed at our mission. I'm, I'm not making up that mission. That's a mission that organizations themselves state. Um. <clears throat> yes, um, quick question. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the continuous struggle that we are engaged in and how when we die, we'll, it's still going to be oh, can ongoing. You speak right into the mic? It's still going to be ongoing, mm -hmm. uh, that struggle. It sounds too uncomfortably, I'm an expert on China, it sounds uncomfortably like Chairman Mao Zedong's continuing revolution mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in which he was creating struggle just to have it all the time. <laughs> Not because there was any reason for right. it, but sure. just because he wanted to just make trouble all the time. Yeah. Okay, or mm -hmm. people who go demonstrate all the time just to have something to be against. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do we distinguish our continuing struggle that we have to mm -hmm. do reluctantly with, against those horrible examples of continuing struggle or continuing revolution? Um, well, I'm not going to use Chairman Mao as an example. I will disagree about people who, who protest and demonstrate. I mean, I'm one of those people, um, and I know a lot of those people, and they would way rather be sitting with their feet up um, watching Steven Universe. Um, you know, they demonstrate because they think something's important, um, you know, because they think something's wrong with the world. So it's how to distinguish, but I know what you're talking about. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, we, we can sort of create struggle and create drama where it doesn't have to happen. Um, what I would say is, again, look at reality. You know, it's like, you know, look look around and look at what is actually happening in the world and look at what, you know, what needs to be changed, what you have the power to change, what we collectively have the power to change. So, um, 
Um, and I think also it's like, you know, how do we distinguish ourselves from Chairman Mao? Well, I think, again, it's like if we're looking at each other rather than at our own empower, you know, our own rise to power. Um, again, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in Chinese history, but um, I think that that's a good way if we're, if we're, and it doesn't mean we have to be self-sacrificing, but if we're looking at um, how do we make the world better, you know, making ourselves king of everything is probably not the way to do it. Um, uh, you know, looking at what, do, again, just being reality-based, what does the world need? Um, and I think a really good way to do that is ask people, listen to people. You know, it's, it's one of the things that's very problematic is when we patronizingly decide this is what you need, you know, and people do that all the time. People decide what poor people need without listening to what poor people need. Um, a lot of what poor people need is money. Seriously, you know. Um, um, uh, you know, so that, I think that that's a lot of it, is listen to what people say they need and take it seriously. Go ahead. Thank you for coming. I really enjoyed mm -hmm. and learned from your speech, and I agree with Tom. It's very good. Thank you. Um, I have never heard anyone articulate the way you have something that I, that I concluded about myself a while back, shortly after 9-11, mm -hmm. that... I'm going to be fighting for certain things all of my life, and I must accept that I will never win them, mm -hmm. that I will never really feel victorious, mm -hmm. that there is no way that I can consider myself uh, f fully satisfied that I've accomplished them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to listen to your, your talk again and try to remember what you have said about how you get mm -hmm. some measure of satisfaction despite losing every day. No, thank you. Thank you for that. And it is, it is something I struggle with. I'm not going to say, read my book and read that chapter and you'll have the answer and you'll be fine. Because part of the answer is we're, it's, it's not fine. Um, I know that one of the things that, and I touched on this in the talk, um, and we can talk about it more later. One of the things that helps me a lot is working with people who are younger than I am. Um, and is one of the things I really appreciate about the current resistance movement is how intergenerational it is. Um, there are people who are younger than I am and there are people who are older than I am. You know, there's people who were active in the 60s, political active in the 60s and 70s when I was a kid. Um, and there's people who weren't born you know, when I was a first uh, beginning to be an activist. Um, and that that's useful for a lot of, it's practically useful because we can share ideas and share information and, you know, everybody knows stuff that the other people don't. Uh, but it also gives me more of that sense of, okay, I'm not going to create utopia in my lifetime, but there will still be people who are alive who are doing this struggle after I'm gone. Hi. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you for mentioning reality. Um, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm the founder of the Church of Reality myself, you know, <laughs> and I find myself in situations where, you know, the atheist community really, you know, hasn't embraced reality the way that, you know, mm -hmm. it should, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, every atheist um, speaker should be, you know, emphasizing reality. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what do we got to do to bring atheism, make reality important in the atheist world? Because, you know, ultimately atheism is about nothing and realism is about everything, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, reality is the reason that makes atheism important. How do you, how do you feel about converting atheists to realists, you know? So, I mean, I don't care about the language so much, you know, it's like, and there's actually a whole chapter in the book about, I don't care what word people, whether they call them atheists, realists, skeptics, humanists, whatever. Um, if the, but the larger question about how do we make atheists more more acknowledging of reality, more less likely to think that because they got the answer to one question right, that they therefore know everything. Oh my gosh, if I had the answer to that question, I would be a very happy person because I am very frustrated in the way ways that people who argue for skepticism are very bad skeptics, you know, the ways that people who say we need to pay attention to experts, you know, who know this stuff when it comes to things like evolution and global warming, ignore experts when it comes to things like sociology um, and, uh, and things like gender bias and racial bias and um, think they're smarter, you know, than they are. Um, you know, it's, you know, ways that you know, I've seen so much in organized atheism um, of the, you know, the leaders and speakers and writers um, 
who will, for instance, say, you know, I really like how angry you are when you speak about religion, and then, like, you know, the next day, they're like, oh, when you talk about feminism, you should tone it down a little bit because you're alienating people. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. It's, I don't know, I wish I knew, because I do fear. I have, it's one of my biggest fears right now, is that there is this amazing resistance movement that's happening right now, and I fear that organized atheism, is, is, organized atheism and humanism and skepticism is going to be irrelevant to it. Um, because there is so much resistance in, organized, in our organized movements, so much resistance and so much hostility towards things like paying attention to the fact that we have bias and trying to unlearn it. Um, so I don't know. I wish I, that's a really good question if anybody has any ideas on how to get people. But the, you know, the, the, that's, it's always a question, right? It's like, how do you get people to reflect and, and look at, you know, look at our own biases? And of course, that's always hard. So I don't know. Hi, can you describe what reality means, especially in the context of ambiguities that we have in our brains, uh, which I will call biological construct, mm -hmm. and also with respect to the social constructs? Because it's very difficult for, at least I find, to just filter out all these constructs and mm -hmm. say that this is the reality. Mm -hmm. So can you describe that? And then the follow-on question is that in Silicon Valley, uh -huh. The reality is that technology solves everything, <laughs> uh -huh. all aspects of life. Can you comment on that? Thank you. Oh, those are two very big questions. I'll try to comment as, as quickly as I can. Um, I don't know how to define reality. And yes, it's, it, it, there's an interesting paradox of prioritizing reality when one of the realities you understand is that you have a biased brain that will never understand it. That's hard. That is, that is a weird paradox. You know, we have biased brains, we have limited brains, we're never really going to understand everything. The best definition of reality that I've seen is that reality is what's there when you're not looking at it. You know, that, you know, there are still going to be black holes when I'm dead. You know, there's, you know, evolution will still be how life f functions when I'm dead. You know, these things are true even if I'm not here. Um, and that's the best, so, and that our commitment to understanding reality is to, to try to, sort of to, to, to well, certainly when it comes to scientific reality, to try to take ourselves out of the picture um, and look at, you know, what is, you know, what, is, what would be there even if I weren't here. It's so, that's somewhat different, obviously, when you're talking about sociology, you know, psychology, um, personal realities, you know, realities of human interaction, because we can't take ourselves out of that. Um, but again, I think w a lot of where where that comes in is listening, you know, listening to people. Um, as far as technology, yeah, technology is not. It, technology is awesome. It's it's going to solve a lot of problems. It's not going to solve everything. Um, technology often creates problems that we don't don't know about, you know, it's like, look at our automobiles, you know, automobiles, you know, created, are creating this massive pollution and contributing to global warming, and we didn't know that when we invented the car, you know, however many decades ago. Um, so, I, I, I think technology is awesome, I'm not anti-tech, um, but I do think that um, tech communities especially can be have a tendency to ignore human reality, have a tendency to ignore, um, you know, they think technology is going to solve racism. You know, it's like, um, uh, you know, they, um, as opposed to, you know, shutting up and listening to, to people. Um, so, so, yeah, I don't know if that helps answer your question, but. Hi, thanks for a wonderful talk. Oh, yeah, I appreciate welcome. your clarity you're and welcome. your insights. Um, the ideals of you know freedom and peace and justice and uh, equality uh, <clears throat> are really human constructs they're not necessarily grounded in reality mm -hmm. they're ideals mm -hmm. uh, and so they're a product of our imagination really and so how does that differ from religion well i would say that that's a, that's a fair question, um, and again, it's a large one. Um, what I would say is that it's not, it is, it's observable that we care about these things. You know, and in fact, there is a significant amount of research being done now. Uh, it's, it's fairly new research, and so it's not solidified yet. Uh, but there's a significant amount of research in what are core human values, what values, and the, the, 
consensus that's building is that we have them, that we have core values that we evolved with as a social species. Other social species also have them, um, that you, you can't really function as a social species without them. And so the, the questions that are being hashed out now are what exactly are those values? How do they play out in different, differently in different cultures, differently among different individuals? Um, but, uh, but it's not, it's not, it's not made up that we care about these things. And it's not made up that these things do help a society function, you know, so. All right, time's up for mm -hmm. Q&A. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And can